this is Stephanie Dixon, interviewer. Um, uh, the veteran's name is Dr. Robert Boone. Uh, when is your birthday? 21 June 1921. Okay, and the war you served in and your branch of service? World War II, Army, National Guard, 206 Coast Artillery, Anti-Aircraft Band. Okay, and what was your highest rank? Tech 3. The date and place of the recording, uh, it is the 66th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. It's December 7, 2007. We are at the Boone home in uh, Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, my name is uh, Stephanie Dixon. I have uh, no relationship to the interviewee except that he was the best friend and the best man of my father. Uh, Bob Johnson. Uh, the others present and assisting, Bill Dixon is assisting behind the camera, and um, his wife Eloise, Dr. Dr. Boone's wife Eloise, and daughter Hannah are present. And this interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress. Okay, uh, Dr. Boone. Can you tell me when and where you were born? Mariana, Arkansas, 21 June 1921. Okay. If, if at all possible, can you answer in a complete sentence? Because I don't know how this might be cut later. I'd just say I was born. Okay. Ask you the question. Um, what were your parents' occupations and who were they? My father was R.M. Boone, Jr., who ran a General, fur general fur Furnishing Merchandise Store with my grandfather, and my mother was a housewife. And what was her name? Ada Wyman Boone. Okay. Did you have any siblings? No. Okay, so you're an only child. I am, and so was my father. All right. Um, what were you doing prior to service? I was attending uh, Camper Military School following graduation from the T.A. Futural High School in Mariana, Arkansas in 1939. And as we were told that we would be called into federal service in the fall of 1940, I did not return to college as I knew I would be taken into service probably in January of 41. Well, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, what, what year did you graduate from high school? 1939. 1939. Um, just for my own personal interest, I'm not sure when my dad graduated from high school. Did y'all graduate together? No, he was uh, one or two classes ahead of me. Why did you choose Kemper Military Academy to go to college? Because my best friend, Maxie Daggett, was going there, and uh, I had no desire to go to a large university such as the University of Arkansas. Okay. Um, just tell me a little bit why you decided, you enlisted, didn't you? Yes. Why did you decide to enlist, especially in the National Guard? Because I wished to play in the band and there was no high school band. And it provided free music lessons, a spending money check, which was quite scarce during the Depression. And I uh, also had fantasies about getting away from home. I think a lot of guys did. <coughs> Excuse me. You told me the other day on the phone who the uh, bandmaster was, and I have forgotten. Who, who was that? His name was Cryer. I do not remember his initials or first name. He was just known simply as the professor. Okay. Did he live in Mariana? Or he yes, he lived on Pearl Street, uh, close to where Julius Benham and his family lived. Okay. Um, 
So you enlisted in the National Guard in order to join the band and learn how to play. Had you had any exposure to music prior to that? No. You just had a desire to learn how to play an instrument? Right. I think that answers my next question. You know, why why did you choose that specific branch of service? Well, it was uh, a regiment that was headquartered in Mariana. The officers in the unit were all acquaintances or friends, and uh, several of my friends were playing in the band, and there was no other outlet and also they furnished the musical instruments. Um, walk me through your process of you all being in the band in the National Guard and then you went to Fort Bliss. Did y'all get called up for your training or how did that happen? We were uh, notified and I believe August of 40 that we would be mobilized. And we were sent to for Minnesota for summer training. And then when we returned in September, the colonel who was a local banker gave all the people who were in college or going to college the option of getting out of the National Guard. But several of us decided that since the draft had been instituted and one year of service was required of all people our age, we would rather spend our time in the service in the company of our friends under officers whom we knew and get our year of service over with. And of course, after we entered service, it was soon announced that there would be no one year of service. It would be at the president's uh, pleasure for our length of service. So it seemed like a good idea at the time, and it blew up on you. <laughs> it didn't really blow up because I think I could have had much worse military service experiences. Were you 16? Thank you. Tell me how old you were when you... I was 16 and I fudged my age a bit and since I later became company clerk I could handle that on the records. You were 16 when you joined the guard? Yes. I'm still trying to figure out how you could do that, uh, even fudging, you know. Uh, so how old were you when you graduated from high school? Uh, 17. Okay. Okay, yeah. This is going very well. Okay. We're working. Uh, I want to back up a little bit and get a little more detail on, on your joining and uh, your age and how you were able to accomplish that. and. and <coughs> You mentioned when the tape was off about uh, the band director really trying to recruit people. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, the uh, band director was under some pressure to uh, fill the ranks and to have a, uh, an acceptable band for summer camps. And uh, we also played in the town square every Wednesday night, which was our drill night. And all the kids would come and run and squeal, and we would march from the old armory to the town square and play along the way. So we were sort of a combination of the Army National Guard and town band. Said something about training in Pensacola. What type of training was that? We went for two weeks every summer for uh, training, and uh, the only convenient place that the gun crews could fire their weapons was out over the Gulf, and the Navy supplied 
tow target planes so that uh, we frequently each summer went to Pensacola, Florida for two weeks in convoy and uh, then convoyed back in each uh, unit which were of course stationed in different towns in East Arkansas would uh, then return to its home base. So y'all, the 206 is, is what your unit was, is that correct? Correct. That was the regimental designation. And it was uh, an anti-aircraft unit, is that, that correct? Yes. So even though you were in the band, you all had to train with weapons? We did not fire weapons, and technically, in time of war, we were supposed to be ancillary personnel for the uh, medical company so that uh, we were not issued arms. What sort of training did you get for the, the medical uh, end of it? Essentially none. We were to go pick people up and haul them to the aid station. I see. Okay. I want to continue to talk a little bit about your age. Could you tell me? Exactly how old you were when you graduated from high school? I was 17. And uh, you were already in the Guard at that point, is that right? Yes, I'd been in for almost two years. Uh, was that a problem, the fact that you were underage? Was that a problem at all? No, because at that time no one anticipated that we would actually be called into federal service or go to war. And uh, it was sort of a thing that a lot of the high school boys did. We served uh, in the uh, aid for the 1937 flood and uh, set up a camp in the local football field for refugees from what was then called the Bottoms, which was the area that overflowed from the Mississippi, Langeal, and St. Francis rivers. Well, uh, all right, I'd like to know a little bit about um, your going to Fort Bliss. Were you called to go up? Uh, As I said, we were notified in late 40 that we would be called into federal service, so I did not return to college. And then on January 6, 1941, we were actually mobilized, but they had no training camp to send us to right then, so we stayed in Mariana and drilled for uh, six weeks or so, and then we were taken by train to Fort Bliss, which was the available artillery range. They needed lots of vacant space to fire the uh, anti-aircraft guns because shrapnel would come down on people if they were fired in a populated area. I am curious about why they chose to call you up then and what was going on politically in the world that might have caused them to call you up then. Well, Hitler had invaded Poland and World War II was raging in Europe. And it seemed at the time that President Roosevelt was quite interested in getting involved. And uh, Britain was under tremendous pressure. So I'm sure that uh, such measures as uh, demanding 50,000 airplanes be manufactured and to uh, call up the troops sort of rattled the saber a little bit and it was maybe hoped would uh, cool Hitler down a bit. Uh, what sort of specialized training did y'all get when you were in Fort Bliss? The uh, band rehearsed and uh, the new members of the band, which were largely college students from the college in Monticello, and the new band director who had just graduated in music there all needed to get together and be functioning. And of course the uh, 
gun batteries went to the range and we were at that time equipped with basically World War I equipment. Radar had not been introduced. So the uh, gun batteries were being issued new equipment, trained on the new equipment, and it was sort of a period for everybody to get everything together. So at no point in any of your training, were you all trained on weapons? No, not until we were in the Aleutians, and then there was a considerable shortage of uh, people, of course, and some of our people volunteered as gunners to ride on the Navy PBYs. Others became ammunition passers or fuse cutters with some of the gun crews. I worked as a uh, technician in the local hospital and uh, various other people had different jobs. Horace Bonner was uh, trained in accounting and he worked for the local finance uh, office. And he was the band director, wasn't he? No, he was just one of the musicians. Okay. And none of that happened until you were actually in Alaska. Right. Okay. Um, any other kind of specialized training y'all got there in Fort Bliss or later? No, we sort of filled in wherever it was felt we were needed and uh, we spent most of our time digging holes and uh, <clears throat> it was decided to disperse the regiment so we were uh, helping build roads and uh, digging in our huts. And this was in Alaska? Yes. Okay. I'm going to Excuse me just a minute. I'm going to have to. Okay. How did you all adapt to military life when you were at Fort Bliss? Was, it, was there an adjustment period? I think we adjusted very well. There was lots of horseplay and uh, going to town and getting drunk and we uh, had a very compatible group, most of whom had been in college and we had very little dissension. Our group didn't have to pull KP or guard duty or any of those things. I will just tell a little story here that I read from a recent book uh, called The Willy Wall War, which is excellent. I have it. Oh, isn't it a good book? Uh, and they, they talked about the last night before y'all left to go toward Alaska. Uh, Colonel Robertson said uh, there was no, he was putting no limits on leave that night. That y'all were leaving in the morning, but that everybody should be back by early in the morning to leave. And of course, Juarez is right across the border, and a lot of guys beat the path over there every time they had a chance. Everybody showed up on time. They had nobody who was AWOL, which I think is remarkable. Wouldn't happen today. Right. <laughs> uh, what sort of physical regimen did they put you all through to get you prepared? The band essentially did uh, calisthenics each morning. And that was about it. Okay. Uh, what sort of housing did you have? We lived in tents on the side of, I believe it's called Mount Washington, which is northwest of uh, the city, or at that time it was. I understand it's all built up now. And it was right <coughs> west of Briggs Army Airfield. How did y'all adjust to the climate there because it's hot desert-like conditions? It was uh, much more pleasant in the winter than uh, eastern Arkansas actually and uh, we had no heat in the tents but uh, I think everyone was reasonably comfortable. Uh, and how 
how about the food? How was the food? It was standard army fare, uh, warm and greasy. <laughs> and uh, you, you sort of touched on the social life. The, you sort of hung around together a lot, the, the guys did. Yes, and we uh, played for uh, dances and we uh, went to, over to Old Fort Bliss and one of my most favorite memories is seeing the last parade and playing in the last parade of the horse cavalry that was stationed in Fort Bliss and then they got rid of all the horses and were re-equipped with jeeps and mechanical means. Uh, where was that unit, the horse cavalry unit, from? Fort Bliss. Fort, they were from Fort Bliss. Did, I mean, where did they come from? Did they come from Arkansas? No, this was a regular army. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, it had been for many, many years the uh, headquarters of the horse cavalry. Can you tell me about you all finding out that you were going to be going to Dutch Harbor, Alaska? I can give you an anecdotal story. I have no idea whether it's actually true, but we trained with the 200th Coast Artillery from New Mexico, and word came out that, boy, we're going to be sent to the Philippines. and there was a story that the two colonels flipped a coin to see who had to go to Alaska and who got to go to the Philippines. And the New Mexico Regiment won. And then, of course, they were completely wiped out on Bataan. So actually, I think in the long run, I'm sure glad for the tales coming up. I have read several accounts of that. Of course, everybody from Mariana who was there told the story you just told. And uh, that's what I heard when I was growing up. And then I read several accounts that said they didn't know if that was a true account or not. It seemed unlikely. But this book I was telling you about, The Willie Wall War, which is exhaustively researched, said that in the 60s, it was General Robertson, by the yes. point, uh, got up at one of their uh, reunions and said, as unlikely as that story seems, that is what happened. So he said it was the truth, and he was one of the colonels. I guess he was still a colonel then. Yes, he, he was. was. one of the ones that was involved in the coin toss. Right. Which is just a remarkable yes, tale to me. Um, okay, can you tell me about, um, turn it off for just a minute. Did we get on, on camera the story about, we got the coin toss on camera, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, I would like to know um, how you got up to Dutch Harbor. Once you all learned you were going, what happened on the way up, how you all traveled, and how long did it take you to get there? As I remember, uh, we traveled by special train, and most of our equipment, which as I mentioned was grossly outdated, was left in uh, Fort Bliss. And we were to go to Fort Lewis, Washington to be re-equipped and then await transportation to Dutch Harbor. And I believe it took about three days. And uh, they had a car on the train to prepare food but we would stop occasionally and a uh, few people were allowed to get off and walk about. And on arrival in Fort Lewis, we, uh, or the gun batteries were re-equipped. We were introduced to radar, which was a new device at the time. And the uh, gun batteries were equipped with uh, somewhat more modern guns and the World War I solid tired old military trucks were re-equipped or replaced with uh, 
more modern vehicles. And the band uh, played uh, at uh, various functions for about two and a half months we were there. And uh, a small group of us also would uh, go into the city at night and uh, play in a nightclub for a little extra money. And so you were, you were allowed to leave wherever you were, of your base, to, to go do that? Yes, we were at the National Guard facility in Fort Lewis. Okay. Did y'all have barracks there? Because I no, we lived in tents again. Okay. Um, how long, what happened when you um, left Fort Lewis? To we uh, were on a uh, troop ship, the USS Grant, which was said to be a, uh, an old ship seized from the Germans at the end of World War I and re-equipped. And the bunks were down in the cargo hole, and uh, they were stacked so close together you had to get out of bed to turn over. And during the trip, it was discovered that uh, it was infested with bed bugs. So a lot of us would sleep up on the deck, and it was uh, good enough weather that uh, that was possible. And we uh, would stop for fuel along the names of the towns I do not exactly remember. And then we went to uh, Seward and stayed a few days and uh, then uh, went on to Dutch Harbor. Was this USS Grant, was it formerly the St. Mihail? Because I've, I've seen a mention of one troop ship, uh, M-I-H-I-E-L, I believe is the, is the name of it. I'm just not certain. And did you go up through the inside passage? Yes, uh, as far as I believe Skagway, and then we cut across to Seward, and uh, then on out to Dutch Harbor. Was it a fairly smooth crossing, or was it rough? Not too bad that time of year. The uh, Willy Wall season hadn't started yet. Well, while you're on that, tell us what a Willy Wall is. A Willy Wall is uh, sort of a, I suppose. Uh, alley name for a storm. Mm -hmm. uh, what sort of form did it take, this storm? The uh, Japanese current hits the cold water all along the Aleutians and causes pretty much constant fog, rain mixed with sleet, and very often extremely high winds. But in the meantime, there may be very pleasant sunny days between. And the wind was so strong that we had to dig the Quonset huts into holes in the ground. And uh, during one of the very active storms, one could really not walk. And there was a picture, which I cannot find right now, of a Marsden mat, which is a heavy steel that was laid down over the muskeg to land airplanes on, being rolled up like an accordion by the wind, which is somewhat unbelievable, but it did happen. Well, when y'all first arrived in Dutch Harbor, what time of year was it? I believe it was early November or late October. Not so much. Um, when, you, when did you run into the bad weather? It usually started in early December and lasted off and on till maybe late May. What sort of duties did they give you all when you uh, first got to Dutch Harbor? How did you all get used to the, the area you were in? The uh, band, uh, as I mentioned earlier, was given the opportunity or uh, 
the uh, chance to help out other places and uh, various others, various of, of us did things that we were somewhat interested in, such as I had been in pre-med in college, so I worked as a lab assistant in the local hospital. We played in the NCO club maybe once a week, which was a uh, Quonset hut dug in a hole in the ground. And then we played at the officers' dances, which were the nurses on the island. And of course, there was a small civilian settlement uh, at Dutch Harbor, and they had uh, a bar called Blackie's Bar, and we could go there to buy drinks. And uh, the uh, gun batteries were in the process of digging in. There were no roads, and the uh, engineers had not arrived yet, so most of that had to be constructed by shovel and wheelbarrow since we didn't really have any construction equipment. And then uh, somewhat later, probably in 1943, the Navy came in and built an airstrip. But until that time, we were very isolated. There would be a supply ship uh, ever so often, and we would go help unload that so we could steal some of the officer's mess meat. Was the food pretty bad? Right after the war started, there was no transportation, and we had fishing crews go out to catch fish, and uh, the uh, I can remember well the uh, cooks boiling ribs and slapping them out on your mess kit and the big blue stamp USDA inspected would still be on it. What did y'all have besides bad meat and, and, and fresh fish? We had uh, some canned vegetables. I also worked as a uh, coating clerk in the local uh, headquarters at night because I had taken typing in high school and uh, there was a shortage of typists. And uh, I got uh, a little extra food that way. I suppose no fresh fruit or vegetables ever. Very little. You all were attacked once. Could you tell me about when that happened and, and uh, what you did during that time? We had been uh, put on alert many times and uh, had been told that we would be attacked at some point. And they gradually built up the force there by adding uh, two infantry regiments. And we, as I mentioned, uh, began to disperse the gun batteries and put them on the surrounding hills. And we moved out of Fort Mears, which was the main camp, up into the hills, dug our huts in, and uh, we had people who were assigned to different gun batteries as helpers, as I mentioned. Some people were ammunition passers. And then we uh, spent most of our time during that period digging and uh, then we would play for various functions and uh, work various places to help out. You, you mentioned to me at one point that you, when a new troop ship came in, y'all would go down and play when they would come in? Yes, and the Navy was gradually building up its sub base, and their uh, ships or subs would come in. One time we had a full battleship and uh, then we would uh, go play for the troops as they got off to welcome them. Now, you said you all were on alert before the Japanese attacked. How, all, how did y'all come to be on alert? How did you know this was about to take place? Well, my pay grade didn't really know that, but we were just uh, told to uh, be ready to uh, 
run for the hills as it was at any night and we had several false alarms and in the confusion one night I put my big rubber galoshes on the wrong feet so trying to get up the hill with the huge galoshes on the wrong feet was took quite a while. Uh, what happened that day when you were attacked? We were uh, alerted probably an hour before that there was some something going on. We of course didn't know that this was a sideshow from the Battle of Midway and then the new radar crews who weren't really familiar with the equipment uh, saw some blips and new planes were coming in and then the first actual attack was uh, by high altitude bombers and that was followed by strafers who of course bombed the main camp which we had vacated and the uh, hospital was blown up some of the civilian workers there and I think maybe a hundred and seventy or so people were killed but we lost no one and had no injuries in my particular unit. Well, were there fatali other fatalities uh, among the, the men that were up there? There were some accidental deaths and uh, some suicides. And uh, I would say, though, that we had very few, if any, battle ca casualties. In, we had none in my particular unit. We were strafed, but we were all in foxholes and dug in. Uh, did you all attempt to fight back? We, uh, a few of us who had rifles uh, fired, and of course the anti-aircraft crews were quite active. And uh, it was fortunate that one of the Zeros was damaged so that the pilot had to attempt a landing. And he unfortunately put his landing gear down hit that musk keg, flipped, and broke his neck. But the plane was damaged very little, and it was located, brought back to the States, where our engineers designed fighter planes to overcome its advantages. Okay. Uh, that sounds like that was a real advantage, too. Yes. Because they had air superiority at the time, didn't they? At the time, yes. Um, what were your, can you remember what your emotions were like when you were in combat and you were maybe witnessing some casualties or people that you knew possibly getting hurt? Well, we didn't hear about anybody getting hurt till the next day. And uh, we, of course, saw the camp burning and knew there were bound to be some people there, particularly in the hospital which was pretty much demolished. And we uh, were then uh, instructed to go help with uh, some of the cleanup. And the, uh, but our particular area just had strafing. Uh, now they came back again, didn't they? Yes, they came the second day. And then, of course, I suppose they had heard of the disaster at Midway and uh, left and went out to occupy uh, Attu. Did they have a base, did the Japanese have a base at Attu during the whole war, or just was it uh, an occupation? What was it? It was essentially an occupation. I don't know all the details for sure but uh, we were told that there had been a weather station at Attu, and it was essentially an uh, uninhabited island. The Japanese uh, dug in and uh, 
it became a big political issue for Roosevelt's third term that the Japanese were occupying American territory. So I think it became politically essential that they be taken off of Attu. Well, how was that accomplished? They sent troops up from the states who were, some of whom were staged in Dutch Harbor, and then went on to assault Attu, okay. which was a very bloody operation. Yes. Did you, did you know any of the personnel that took No, these people were all from, unfortunately, California and not properly equipped for Aleutian weather. And it is said that they lost more people from gangrene of the feet and uh, weather-related injuries than were uh, killed in actual combat. But I don't actually know that that's true. You can confirm this or deny it. I mean, I've always heard that between the first and the second Japanese attack, the officers and, and Colonel or General Robertson, I think, was part of it, kept people up all night moving around the munitions because the first part was essentially um, the first attack was re reconnaissance, and they took pictures about where they thought everything was. So that night they kept everyone up moving. Yes, they, it was rather miraculous that they could move an entire gun battery, dig it in, in a new position overnight, but it was done. And as a result? As a result, we had very few or no casualties and they were because not the not Japanese not. bombed the old gun position where no one was. I assume that boredom was as big a problem as anything. Uh, what all did you all do to keep yourselves entertained and, and not fall into a depression? Well, as I mentioned, uh, there were a fair number of suicides, but we uh, fished and uh, had small groups who would uh, play our instruments, and we also, uh, probably half of the band had a job somewhere that uh, we either worked uh, with one of the gun crews, as I mentioned, some of the fellows rode with the Navy as gunners. Others would uh, work at various things that needed a hand. As I said, I worked as a code clerk at the uh, base headquarters for a while, and for a while I worked in the hospital as a lab assistant. I want to ask you about Blackie's bar. I have heard that Blackie, the owner of the bar, may have been a brother or half-brother of Pretty Boy Floyd. Had you heard that? I had not heard that, and I only was uh, able to visit Blackie's bar once or twice because drinks were three to four dollars, which was astronomical at that time. I guess so. Well, as I said, that's just, uh, I've heard that comment a couple of times. I don't know if there's any truth to it or not. Um, how did you stay in touch with your family and friends back home, and how did you hear from them? We had uh, fairly reliable mail service, and uh, we wrote uh, letters. Of course, there was no telephone communication, but uh, we got letters from home. I also uh, had a correspondence course going with the University of Tennessee for a while, and uh, there was plenty to do if one looked for it. I think we've talked about recreation and off-duty pursuits. I did have one question that Sandy Beecham wanted me to ask you. Do you remember Cliff Williams? Yes, very well. She wanted to know if you remembered when Cliff broke his arm. 
that he got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and fell off the back porch because it was icy and he broke his arm and it was a clean break so they didn't set it and what they did for him to strengthen that arm is they gave him a bucket of coal to carry and then he carried that bucket of coal around with him all the time i don't remember that particular episode she also says that he kept having to replenish the coal because it would get cold at night and his bunkmates would dump his coal out and burn it overnight well we had uh, what were called sibley stoves which were just conical pieces of metal with a pipe going out of them and uh, most of them were fired with compressed sawdust and uh, we would also go to the dock and help unload coal ships and one could as you say take your own bucket and uh, but most of the time we had a little fire going in the stove either in the dugout or the hut. Were the conditions pretty primitive in those huts? They were standard issue uh, Quonset huts which we began to get probably about January or so of uh, 42. Up until that time we had lived in eight-man squad tents which were quite uncomfortable and windy. Okay, um, now I know what young men are like. And if drinks at Blackie's were three and four dollars, y'all had to have some sort of alternative uh, method of... Well, I was designated as supply sergeant and company clerk. So uh, I made what was called Sneaky Pete which was uh, a fermented beverage made of raisins and whatever dried fruit we could scrounge from the mess sergeant. And this was put in uh, jugs and passed around. So you used your college chemistry for, for that, right? Yes. And you were a very popular fellow, I see. And some people were able to take one of the old large granite coffee pots, whittle a wooden insulator to fit in the spout, and get a uh, piece of copper pipe and somewhat strengthen the sneaky peat through partial distillation. There was a rumor going around that some people had taken a 30 caliber machine gun and used the water barrel, the water cooler from that to uh, cool the steam but I never actually saw that operation happen. That's amazing. What, what links people will go to in an emergency. Uh, I know you and I discussed the fact that, uh, I think it was in Ford, what year was it that y'all had the furloughs to come home? Was it 43? 43, the regiment was uh, sent back to the states and the uh, band was given the opportunity to transfer into a gun battery, go back to the states, be re-equipped and sent on to Europe or we could stay there and Bob, your father and I elected to stay there and uh, then shortly thereafter, we were sent to Amchitka, which is much further out the chain, and uh, a number of uh, replacements was sent, all of whom were draftees. Well, were you allowed to come home on furlough? Yes, we were given a chance to come home on furlough as part of that process. The uh, military said that we could have the furlough, but we'd have to find our own transportation. So our orders were cut, and we could go down to the dock and wait on something that was going to the States. 
And one day we were at the dock and this dilapidated tug came through pulling a barge of scrap. And he said that he was short two men on the crew so we could ride to the States. So your father and I got aboard, but it turned out that during one of the storms, the front hatch had been seriously damaged and the available bunks leaked water a good bit of the time. So I slept in the engine room. Incidentally, this was an old World War I hand-fired with coal tug. So the engine room was quite dusty and I slept on a coil of rope in there. And by the time we got to the States some 29 days later, I was uh, very dirty since there were no facilities to shower or wash. And I understand that your, your friend, my father, was sick. Yes, he became very seasick, and when the dilapidated tug finally got to Prince Rupert, Canada, he was put off to go to the hospital and be rehydrated from his prolonged vomiting. And I was put on a freight and passenger boat going to Vancouver, and then on a train to... Uh, Fort Lewis, where I was cleaned up, given some clothes, and uh, went on to uh, Minneapolis on the train, and then down to Arkansas, where my furlough started. How long were you able to be there? We had 30 days. And, and my dad, I understand, came down a little bit later when he was well. Yes, after he recovered, he was sent on to the States, and fortunately, all this travel time did not come off of our furlough since it didn't start until we actually left Fort Lewis. When you got back up, to, did they send you directly to Amchitka? Did you go back to Dutch Harbor for a short time, or, or how did that work? We went to Dutch Harbor and uh, got all of our equipment on a uh, what was called a uh, barge. It was actually a powered barge and meandered out to Amchitka, which was quite a long way. And what did you all do there until the end of the war? Uh, we were in a band, of course, and we played for some parades, some officers club. I had to pull guard duty a couple of times on the balloons that the Japanese were sending over trying to set fire to the woods in Washington, and uh, one of them fell or was shot down on Amchitka and was kept under lock and key, an armed guard for some reason. What kind of balloons? They were large uh, balloons that had uh, something in them that was supposed to set the woods afire when they came to Washington. I also never heard that my dad spent any time on Amchitka at all. Was, were there a lot of people there, or was this a very small group? It was a 28-piece band, okay. and the uh, rest of the military was uh, partly Navy, partly uh, uh, Army troops, and uh, the Air Corps at that time, which had not been separated into the Air Force, built an airstrip and used it to fly reconnaissance out of. Okay. Bill, shut it off for just a minute. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, what unit number you were in at the end of the war. When we left Dutch Harbor, we were redesignated as the 238th Army Ground Forces Band. And then, as I mentioned, when we got to Amchitka, 
we began to get replacement members for the people who had transferred to the other units and gone back to the states. Okay, and, and this last part is about the end of the war. Uh, where were you uh, when you found out the war had ended? I had already been discharged from the service in, uh, I believe it was May of 45, whenever the war in Europe ended. We were told that everyone who had, I believe it was at that time, 120 combat points could uh, go back to the states for discharge. And your father and I elected to do that. But again, we had to find our own way back. So I got a plane going to ADAC, went there and pulled my first day of KP because I was uh, only a buck sergeant and uh, everybody there had rank. And then I got another plane to Anchorage and then another plane to Edmonton, Canada, and I stayed there to get new orders, to get transportation, then by train to Minneapolis and by train to Fort Smith, where I was discharged. How did you get home from Fort Smith? I rode the bus. And what sort of greeting did you get at home? Well, my father and mother were happy. <laughs> and you were too, I assume. Yes. Uh, do you remember um, how you readjusted to civilian life? Was it difficult or was it easy? It was difficult because after having someone to tell you day to day what to do, then you suddenly realize, my God, I've got to do this on my own. And I knew I wanted to return to college. My father had been very uh, unhappy that I was not going to become a farmer as he was and be with him. So I decided to go back to the university in agriculture. But I was able to take uh, all of my chemistry and wind up with a chemistry major. And after trying to work with my father, who was a pretty stubborn person, I decided that simply would not work, so I went back in pre-med. Then I met my future wife, and we uh, decided that I would go to medical school, so she uh, tried to get or did get a teaching certificate so she could support me during medical school. And when I was selected for admission, we had a friend in Little Rock who was able to find an apartment for us, and we moved there. What year were you married? 1946. Okay. We have a very little time left. Um, I assume you went on the GI Bill? Yes, I had uh, saved, I had made an allotment of my pay while I was in the Aleutians to go to the local bank, Colonel Robinson's bank. And I only got $15 a month while I was in the Aleutians. But when I got home, I had $1,800 cash. So I used that and I played in a dance band at the university and various nightclubs around to uh, help support us there and then I saved my GI Bill for medical school. We, we may shut off in just a minute, Bill, but I want to find just real quickly, uh, uh, any life lessons you learned from the service or, or how you notice how it affected your life, that experience? Never volunteer for anything. <laughs> we will cut right there. <laughs>